In 1977, after a decade in the business, the British rock group Fleetwood Mac suddenly emerged as one of the biggest rock bands on the planet. And at the heart of their fame was the American girl who had appeared from nowhere to front the group, Stevie Nicks. She was beautiful, she was witchy, and damn right, it all played into the, the great success of Fleetwood Mac in the late 70s. A free woman, a sexually liberated woman, who owns herself, owns her own sexuality, very pretty in a conventional way, but out there, a player, just like the men. I think that was new in rock. You know, Stevie is an original. Yeah, you can pull, pull little bits from a lot of different artists, but she's an original. The magic, I've seen it. I've seen it happen as soon as she goes on stage and in every scenario I've I've been involved. I think even people that aren't huge Stevie Nicks fan, if you if you go to one of these shows, uh, you're gonna you're gonna see some of that. You're gonna experience some of that. Over the next 40 years, Stevie became one of the most iconic figures in rock and roll, transfixing audiences with her breakdowns, breakups, addictions, and triumphs. This is Stevie's story. To make the music and to write the songs that she has has done she has sacrificed huge parts of her personal life and i suspect that is true of you know most of the people whose music and art has has endured In 1966, Stevie Nicks, 18 years old and a talented singer, began dating guitarist Lindsey Buckingham during their senior year at Menlo Atherton High School in Los Angeles, and one of the most important musical partnerships in rock and roll was born. California was in the midst of the hippie era, and Stevie and Lindsey, together with their band Fritz, started their career during San Francisco's Summer of Love opening for the iconic acts of the time, including Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, and the Jefferson Airplane. Though without a record deal, Fritz remained a fixture on the Californian circuit as the hippies fell away and music moved into the 1970s. By the early 70s, the West Coast sound of California was reverting to uh, the, the melodicism and the harmonies uh, of the mid-60s. It'd gone through the... the the, the psychedelic era. Uh, and so by the early 70s, you know, even bands like The Grateful Dead, famous for 30-minute uh, you know, versions of Dark Star with extended guitar solos, they're doing country-ish uh, tinged albums with tight songs. So uh, I, I, I guess pop music has become cool again. And this is, this is uh, firing the Californian sound of, of, of the early 70s. This was a time when everyone from Bonnie Raitt to Little Feet to Jackson Brown to Joni Mitchell were making truly eclectic music. We're coming out of the 60s. You have artists exploring the connections between blues, country, rock and roll, pop. And that's the space that Stevie Nicks steps into. Though Fritz had achieved some popularity as a live act in the Bay Area, they had failed to attract the attention of a record industry more interested in singer-songwriters than a post-Summer of Love San Francisco band. When record producer Keith Olsen eventually made the trip from LA to assess the group, he concluded that the potential of Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham was far greater than that of Fritz. The band was pretty good, but Stevie and Lindsey were great. There, that's, what can I say? So, I, I mentioned it to you know, after trying to do a demo that I was really interested in working with Stevie and Lindsay and not with the band. And so, you know, how that goes, that goes over really poorly. You know, and that's, you know, a really sad thing to do. And so you feel terrible doing that, but that's reality. Lindsay developed a style and started writing these songs with Stevie and they recorded these demos on his four track and they were stunning. And so, they came down, played them for me. And I said, 
we can get a deal. So um, we ran out, we got a deal and recorded them. You may not be as strong as me. You know, I wanted to get this team of people. You know, uh, record production is really putting together a team, you know, so that Lindsay could be at ease and could just play off mus other musicians because when you have musicians in one room all playing together, magic happens. You know, we had Waddy, Wachtel, uh, we had Ronnie Tutt and Jerry Chef. Ronnie Tutt, Jerry Chef, it's basically Elvis's rhythm section and we had some just some great players that were all about that just dove into what Lindsay was playing and said oh yeah we can do this and it was it was quite fast she was that kind of lady. no longer part of a band Stevie found herself in a position where she would have to assert herself as an artist alongside her more versatile partner. While Lindsay was the lead instrumentalist and musical director on the album that would become known simply as Buckingham Nicks, Stevie was credited with half of the songs on the record. There's no doubt that Stevie's early partnership with Lindsay Buckingham, both on an artistic and personal level, formed who she was. However, she still, even as a very young woman, had her own set of interests and her own kind of approach to music. So even on Buckingham Nicks, you can hear some of those ballads that are concerned with what it means to be a woman striking out on your own, independence, uh, the tension between love and freedom. All of those themes are there on her very first recorded songs. What, what Stevie Nicks learned from Lindsay Buckingham, I think, is a kind of tunefulness and a, a pop sense. She had her songs that Lindsay really took and, and molded. And sometimes it was really cool. And sometimes Lindsay would think, no, no, we don't want to do that there. The Stevie Nicks songs had that little bit of folky lightness. And uh, Lindsay's uh, material had this deeper uh, sense of feel. A key aspect of Stevie Nicks' early career is that starting with Lindsay Buckingham, she was in harmony with someone on every level. In harmony artistically, personally, but also vocally. Stevie Nicks is a great harmony singer and learning how to do that in that first partnership with Lindsay Buckingham was so crucial to developing her talent. I think the Buckingham Nicks album is a strong record. The guitar work, there's a real organization to it. It's got a, it's got a, um, it's got a real uh, purpose in its production values as well. The second thing that hits you is how unconfidently they present Stevie Nicks's voice. They, they have a double track all the way through. Now Stevie Nicks has got a very unusual voice, very textured, a lot of timbre in there. That's a, there's a bit of edge in there. But I get the impression that to, to just put it there unadulterated as a single vocal track was, was, was something they weren't comfortable with or perhaps Lindsay Buckingham wasn't, wasn't comfortable with. And he had a double track all the way through, which makes it a little gentler on the ear and a little, a little easier as a listen, but it somehow dilutes the, the uniqueness of her, of her timbre. Bits of it are like the Carpenters, but given a bit of rock heft. Uh, so it's very melodic, um, very mellifluous, uh, and, and really, it is a template for what they're going to do with Fleetwood Mac, and you can, you can listen to that record, and I think you can appreciate what Mick Fleetwood heard that he thought could then be imported profitably into Fleetwood Mac. In spite of all the promise, 
Buckingham Knicks flopped badly. With their finances stretched, Lindsay and Stevie moved in with Keith Olsen, and Stevie took a waitressing job while Buckingham worked on material for a potential follow-up album. But with no sign that sales would improve, Buckingham Knicks were eventually dropped by Polydor Records. When we did the deal for Buckingham Knicks, uh, you know, the amount of cash we got was enough to pay for studio, some overdubs, a few extra players, and I think we had $5,000 a piece. And so each one of us got $5,000, period. And, uh, and we're try everybody's trying to stretch that. And so, yeah, you can stretch that as far as you can, but it doesn't go very far. There's something about Buckingham Knicks that feels a little minor in a way, a little uh, bit recessive. It's a great record, don't get me wrong, but it's not going to jump out on radio. And that is what, once Stevie and Lindsay enter into the Fleetwood Mac family, they find their place, they find their way to be more aggressive with their sound and hit it on radio. Buckingham Knicks were not the only Californian act to have found their career stalled. The British blues boom ensemble Fleetwood Mac, lately of Los Angeles and lacking a guitarist, frontman and lead songwriter, were searching for a new direction. In contrast to Buckingham Knicks, Fleetwood Mac were battle-weary industry pros. Having emerged from the British blues scene, the band had undergone several reinventions and by the early 70s had amassed a core following and reasonable presence on the US music scene. Sustained commercial success, however, continued to elude Fleetwood Mac, and frequent personnel changes had stunted the group's development. In 1974, band leader Mick Fleetwood was on the lookout for new blood. Well, Fleetwood Mac, of course, become famous for the soap opera of the mid to late 70s, after Stevie and, and Lindsay have joined. But in fact, the soap opera is in full swing long before then. I mean, you know, by the time Buckingham Knicks join, I think uh, they've already made nine albums and they've gone through this range of personnel. Uh, they've started out as uh, a fantastic blues band in London in the late 60s. Peter Green, magnificent guitarist, you know, up there with Eric Clapton in my estimation. I can't help about the shape I'm in. I can't sing, I ain't pretty and my legs are thin. But don't ask me what I think of you. I might not give the answer that you want me to. And they've then got more experimental, expanded the blues template, and had hits as well with things like Green Man Alishi and, and uh, Albatross. Peter Green then loses it and departs. Jeremy Spencer, another guitarist in the band, then loses the plot and goes off to join some group of Jesus freaks. And then Danny Kerwin, third guitarist, drinking heavily, violent, uh, and he's evicted from the band. So they've already gone through all of this upheaval that would have uh, finish somebody with uh, lesser determination than Mick Fleetwood. Because Fleetwood Mac are a rhythm section, plus Christine McVie, who joins as a keyboard player in 1970, because they're just a sort of rhythm section, what they need all the time is uh, a guitarist and a writer. Once they lost both Spencer and Green, they understood they needed to do something else. They needed a, some sort of a front person besides Christine, who was a damn good songwriter. They needed another they needed a male front person, so they chose this guy, Bob Welch, who was in many respects like Lindsey Buckingham, and uh, he was uh, basically a, a folk pop guy. The period with Bob Welch right, as, as the main songwriter, along with Christine McVie, uh, is a kind of transitional period for Fleetwood Mac. They have moved beyond the blues roots of the band and edged towards this uh, more mellifluous, uh, easy listening sound that, that will reach its apogee with, uh, with rumours. They're quite underrated, the albums they made with, with, with Bob Welch, really. I mean, they're full of, full of fine songs. Uh, but it is, it, it, you know, in retrospect, you see this as a bridge between the old Fleetwood Mac and the new Fleetwood Mac, the, the, the blues band led by Peter Green, and then the band they become with 
with Lindsay Buckingham and Stevie Nicks. Now the swamp is getting deeper all the time. The faces that I see don't seem to shine. That's right. Now there's too much more hole hanging off the wall. And the mystery that there used to be is gone. Gonna go. They were reasonably successful in America at the time. But in retrospect, given what Fleetwood Mac became, there's something a little uh, undistinguished, perhaps, about, about that period of Fleetwood Mac, the Bob Welsh period. And no particular reflection on, on Bob Welsh either. It, it was the times. There were a, a, a lot of groups that sounded quite like Fleetwood Mac in the, uh, in the early mid-70s. When, in 1974, Bob Welch abruptly announced his departure from Fleetwood Mac, leaving the band in desperate need of a replacement guitarist and songwriter, a chance encounter with Keith Olsen brought the Buckingham Knicks album to the attention of Mick Fleetwood. A person I knew said that uh, Fleetwood Mac was trying to find a studio to record in and somebody to engineer and work with them. So I said, well, why don't bring him into Sound City. Mick really liked the room because it's big. And he said, well, let me hear what this room sounds like. So I played Frozen Love. And he walked out of there saying, we are going to record here. You're going to do the record. Done. We're going to start in February. On New Year's Eve, he called me. And he says, Bob Welsh just left the band. And I would really like to have that guitar player from those kids that you played me join my band. And I said, well, you know, um, they're kind of a, a pair. What I didn't realize, but very shortly into the conversation, he said, look, these two are like joined at the hip. They're, they're a couple. They write together. They sing together. They live together. They, they do everything together. So uh, I very soon realized it was sort of like a, a joint venture. And so he says, could you ask them to see if they'll join my band? And I said, sure. Lindsay said, oh, man. I don't think I could ever fall, follow after Peter Green. He had so much respect for, you know, the players from the past of Fleetwood Mac. You know, they said, God, you know, I can't. How could I follow those guys? Those, those guys were great. And I'm, I'm trying, you know, I'm rolling my eyes back. But Lindsay, you're pretty good yourself, you know. And it was an on and on and on. By the end, I think it was like 2.30 and... AM. He finally said, okay, we'll try it for a little while. I got the records, I listened to them, and I thought, well, Chris can really sing, and so this will be good. We can, Lindsay and I can still sing together. We're not, we're not giving up that much. Um, I think Lindsay thought we were giving up a little more than I did, and I also think that it mattered more to me to start making some money than it did to Lindsay. Because I was, you know, I was the one that was being a waitress, and he was practicing his guitar. With Buckingham Knicks in the band, Fleetwood Mac now had to begin the task of finding their new sound. Warners, the band's label, had some reservations about the new lineup, and although they agreed to finance an album with Keith Olsen producing, there was a feeling that the group were fast running out of second chances. There were bare trees at the time, and Warner Brothers, uh, you know, there was this guy that I knew at Warner Brothers really well, who was the um, head of business affairs at the time, and said, yeah, we just think this band could be so much more. And they, uh, they have a, they, he kept saying, they have this following, and they're, it's really a strong following. If we could spread that demographic, we could really do something great with this band. When I came on, I knew that Buckingham Nicks is this commercial pop rock thing. Uh, Mick Fleetwood and John McVie and Christine were part of the old blues era, but... Mick is a rock-solid drummer. John is a really rock-solid bass player, simplistic rock-solid bass player, which is perfect for the time. And uh, Christine had that other voice that is so totally unique, part of the, the past, but it would, it's going to work really well. 
and has this other writing style, harmonic style, and keyboard style. And I felt that it was going to be a really good mix. What Lindsay and Stevie bring is this uh, energy, drive, ambition, uh, and that, you know, really fires Mick Fleetwood and John McVie and, and, and Christine McVie up. And uh, from the point where you think the band is going to fold, Lindsay and Stevie come in and reinvigorate the band and, and really remake it more or less in their own image. I think it's Buckingham musical conception that matters. Stevie Nicks then gives them something else, which is uh, a third lead singer uh, and, an, and obviously a, uh, an increasingly powerful force who turns out being uh, the great solo hero of the band. Uh, but in the early days, that's not really so clear. Indeed, Stevie had not been directly invited to join Fleetwood Mac and found herself in the band as part of the package required to secure Buckingham. The group already had a female songwriter and vocalist in Christine McVie, and unlike Lindsay, Nix faced the particular challenge of having to define her role. How dare this, you know, California bimbo, which is how they looked at me, um, come in and walk out into the center of our stage and be the lead singer overnight? How dare she? They realized really quickly that I wasn't trying to take anything away from them, I, and I wasn't. And I really did love them and want them to be wonderful. And, and I certainly didn't want to take anything away from Chris. Because I liked her and I respected her and she was really nice to me. There's something very earthy and down home about Christine. It's a, it's a female voice, but it's not a sexy female voice. Call it modest and calm. Stevie Nicks is not modest. Stevie Nicks is... Uh, full of herself. Um, and, uh, and, and that is, uh, I mean, as this, you know, we're, as the 70s are progressing, it's a very, very attractive musical commodity. Not that many people doing it, at least not yet. Christine has a uh, real drawn deep voice. It's like velvet. And Stevie is this nasally thing that is almost on the verge of being, <laughs> you know, a goat. And so you put the two together and you get something that is really unique. What they actually brought us to, to Fleetwood Mac was a, an, in, a t an entirely fully formed aesthetic. If you go to that Buckingham Nicks album and in your imagination remove Jim Keltner and all those and all those other guys who were the rhythm section and transplant the no-nonsense direct rhythm section of Fleetwood Mac over those songs on that album it wouldn't sound very much different to that Fleetwood Mac album from 1975. In February 1975 Fleetwood Mac set up in LA's Sound City Studios to begin recording the album that would relaunch the band to be titled simply Fleetwood Mac. Though they had rehearsed together, it was unclear as to how the players would gel in the context of producing a record. Lindsay Buckingham assumed the role of musical director and the group worked on developing a coherent sound and style. Lindsay was taking charge by then and he was saying, let's go to the course here, I'll do this going in there. And was, okay, and it was right. Lindsay's coming up with this lick and Christine's starting to get this idea and then Lindsay sang this chorus line and then Stevie sang the harmony on this chorus line and it, you know, four hours later, it's pretty cool. And, you know, so it was, it was obvious that they had a chemistry. And, you know, you don't see that kind of, kind of chemistry often. When we were cutting tracks, uh, John came up to me and said, said, Keith, you, you know, we used to be a blues band. <laughs> and uh, I said to him, yeah, but this is a shorter distance to the bank.
What you're really getting there is synergy. Classic rock group synergy. And in this case, it has to do with this fabulous rhythm section. And on top of it, one, two, three good singers and songwriters. And, in my opinion, Buckingham's sense of how to put things together. It's weird, like, I don't feel like I'm doing anything differently than I've been doing for a long time. It's just people's, the way people see is changes, you know, right, but that's... we're still just going along, you know, as insecure as I'm so afraid. Suddenly, for the first time in that album, Fleetwood Mac again have got great songs. They sound great on the radio, uh, they're lyrically smart, they're um, brilliantly produced. Making music um, is really the, the main, I feel it's the main way that I can express myself and uh, it's like a window to the outside world in a way. If right, you, know you write I mean. very personal songs that are... Uh, at, sometimes I don't think so, but they end up being pretty personal. Uh, in retrospect, I think most of the songs that I've written, um, even though if I think I'm not even writing about myself, eventually I realize that it was something to do with, with myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, it, I feel very uh, honored, uh, lucky that, I, that we can express ourselves in that way, that I can express myself it's not said, I don't think, as, as often as it could be said, that Buckingham, for all his Kingston trio and his finger picking and his, 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 uh, his interest in, in that, sort of, that sort of guitar playing, uh, he was also a Beach Boys nut. He was also a Beatles nut. He had a pop head on him, Lindsay Buckingham, and he understood that to, to make Fleetwood Mac to stand out, all those songs needed to be hooky and memorable and just go beyond that, that, that kind of, uh, that sort of amorphous soft rock sound. And I think that's what really made the difference. It, that's what really makes it stand out. When it got delivered, when the album got delivered to uh, the same guy that I knew, called me screaming, saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is really, really going to be special and that's all he would tell me well then you know it was the release of Fleetwood Mac in July 1975 propelled the band to superstardom as it climbed to number one on the billboard chart and swiftly became a staple of radio playlists across the US having joined the band as Lindsay Buckingham's girlfriend Stevie's contribution was estimable the record featured three Nick's compositions, including the future Fleetwood Mac standard, Landslide, and Rhiannon, the album's highest charting single, and one of the group's signature songs. Rhiannon was the, was the one that, that, that really established her in the imagination of a Fleetwood Mac audience. In a way, it's a kind of prototype of a particular sort of Stevie Nicks song. It's in the minor key, it's got a kind of brooding groove. It seesaws backwards and forwards between two closely related chords. She's never been particularly interested in, in chord sequences. It's more, she's more interested in, in the melody line. And what made it uh, extra special for her was that it became a tour de force on stage.
she did things with her voice on that song, and particularly live, that was un unbelievable. Even in Fleetwood Mac, they didn't capture that that anger, that energy, and the vibe, or, where she was just raspy and so almost screaming the, the sound of Rihanna. And well, you know, it, it was where Stevie got her to me, where she got her sound and got her start. Uh, fantastic song. To me, the, the music is writing songs, and that is to be able to write something that maybe at a time in somebody else's life they need a little help or a little inspiration or something that they would sit down and listen to something that I wrote, and it would just either make them feel a little better or they'd be able to go, yeah, yeah. somebody else has been there too, and that helps me. And mm -hmm. that, to me, is the most important. Right. When you're writing, are you thinking of the kind of people you're writing for? You, you have no idea. Well, all of my songs are written about real people, either me or a friend or something. So no, but the people you write those songs for, the people who are going to hear it, you any well, idea what kind of people they are? They have to be similar to me, mm -hmm. I figure. And if, if I'm writing about something that is, I've gone through, then certainly they've, they're going through it or will at some point. And so it has to be some... I mean, that's how I feel when, when somebody writes something. You know, if I can sit down and... and be going through a crisis and I can listen to Joni Mitchell or something and I can feel from her that she understands even though she doesn't know me then for that I you know I, I love that and that's what I try to do. With Fleetwood Mac climbing the charts the band embarked on a grueling US tour in support of the album. As audiences became familiar with the new lineup it was Stevie Nicks in particular that monopolized the attention of both the paying public and the watching press corps. Blonde, pretty, sings great, fronts the band, doesn't have a guitar or a keyboard in front of her. You know, Christine is a, a pretty and a good singer, but always had that, she was always off to the side playing a keyboard. That's not a front of the band, you know. So, yeah, they would give Stevie a lot of attention. No one would argue that Stevie Nicks cements the image of Fleetwood Mac. Without Stevie Nicks, Fleetwood Mac are not superstars, and this is what develops very quickly once she is in the band. Her presence, her image, is perfect to sell this band to a large audience in the early to mid-70s when the image of the woman in rock is shifting from kind of blues mama and uh, folk songbird, blues mama of Janis Joplin and folk songbird of Joni Mitchell to a much more arena friendly uh, image that Stevie embodies. It was all very much connecting a kind of a, a folkish hippie goddess persona with a more contemporary sex symbol persona. With the tour behind them, Fleetwood Mac traveled to Sausalito, a small waterfront town across the bay from San Francisco, to begin recording at the Record Plant Studios away from the rock star circus of Los Angeles. Over the course of the tour, the band had become a closer musical collective, and this familiarity enabled them to produce a new album, Rumors, more organically. Where previously tracks had been brought to sessions all but fully formed, the writers in the group could now develop their material in the studio, in tandem with the other band members. The second month of recording Rumors, Rhiannon was just climbing, screaming up the charts, and and we suddenly were getting these accolades from everybody that this is really going good. So at that point, I believe that, that the effects of, of Rihanna taking off on the charts and the, the fans actually substantiating the fact that it was really good and Fleetwood Mac was good gave them a lot more confidence. And so there became a lot more energy added into each of the songs and rumors. Because each of the songs and rumors was written in rumors in the studio. You know, Stevie would walk in and let's say, start playing the song, and I have this idea, guys, for a song, and, and Lindsay would grab his acoustic guitar and start playing along with it, and then John would get his acoustic bass and start playing along with it, and Mick would be beating on, you know, his, his pants, you know, legs with drumsticks, and Christine would get a, her little Wurlitzer in there and start playing it, and right in front of my eyes, in a, real, in a control room like this, they were building the song, and they would, they would play it down, and then 
this, Lindsay might say, you know, what if you just did a little pause there? And then Mick would say, yeah, and I'll fill that pause with a hit. And then John would go, I don't even enter, lead it into it with a, with a riff. And it's like, it was a magic. But although Fleetwood Mac were firing musically, their personal relationships were collapsing. Mick Fleetwood arrived in Sausalito with his marriage on the rocks. Stevie and Lindsay in the midst of a bitter breakup, and the band's married couple, Christine and John McVie, in the early stages of a painful divorce. All hell was breaking loose. You know, John and Chris were breaking up. My marriage with Jenny was broken up. I was the only one that was spared having to work 24 hours and be with your partner. So I was in the middle of these four people who were going through various forms of emotional hell. And we made and went into the making of rumors in that emotional hell. Lindsay and Stevie's relationship was, was, was very um, dynamic, uh, and the band had to kind of survive it. But I'd say even more so than that was John and Chris's. You know, because John, they had already uh, decided to get a divorce by this time. And, uh, but John would, um, every time John would have a drink, he was, uh, he was really still in love with Chris. He knew that basically, I, I believe it, what it was, he had decided that at some point uh, it, he was going to have to choose Chris or, over booze, and he decided to go with the latter. But when he would have a few drinks in the studio, he would kind of start to, you know, buzz around Chris, and, and that created more of a problem more of the times in the studio uh, because it would piss Christine off, you know. And, uh, and, and then John would just have another drink and then he'd get all pissed off and, and go home. It was not easy for John. I don't think it was easy for Chris either, but uh, just as a man, I saw a, a lot of pain for John. With Chris, she saw me at the worst one time too many. And bless her heart, she said enough. I, I don't want to be around this person. Um, so we talked about it and uh, made the decision. But at the bottom of all of that stuff was uh, we, we have something musically that we can achieve. We actually uh, didn't talk at all. John and I did not talk. Stevie and Lindsay didn't get on very well either, but they used to fight, you know, whereas John and I used to just avoid each other. Um, they used to fight, although not all the time. They, 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 they could, in actual fact, get on quite well, especially when they were writing songs together. Uh, John and I did not write songs together, and we did not talk, period. Um, except for the civilities in life, like what key is his song in, you know. Uh, that would be more or less it. And so we just spent six months in that studio avoiding each other. Stevie and Lindsay, uh, they were much more sophisticated. You know, they dealt with their issues, and they, 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 they went home to their own places, and they didn't talk, and... Uh, um, I, I think maybe that's why Lindsay was so nervous all the time, because maybe he wanted to talk to Stevie, but they just didn't. When we joined Fleetwood Mac, everything was really rocky between me and Lindsay. Let's fix these relationships for right now, because we cannot break up. We just can't. If we do, there will be no Fleetwood Mac. Stevie and Lindsay were doing background vocals on, a, on one of... Uh, uh, Chris's songs, You Make Love and Fun, and they were singing, you, ooh, ooh, you make love and fun, ooh, ooh, and uh, everything was fine, and we stopped tape to, to make a little change on something, and suddenly Stevie looked over at Lindsay and she said, screw you, asshole, you know, you, you know, I, I hate you, and he looks, and he yells back, oh, fuck you, I, I was rewinding the tape just so I could get back to music, and, and sure enough, I got back to the second chorus and hit play, and they went, you and they they didn't miss a beat they, they just looked at the microphone and and put the smiles back on the face and sang the part well the machinery of it the role of it had already gotten so great that there was never any consideration of you know do we want to stay together or do we want to approach this in another way uh we we just had to play the handout and the only way to do that was to take all of these feelings say my feelings for stevie and vice versa and to sort of cram them into one corner of the room and then to get on with whatever was going on with your process 
in the rest of the room. Here they are, this sort of dysfunctional group of people, all in different kind of relationships with each other that are falling apart, writing songs about them, singing them together, and it did give these songs a real edge um, that I think you could hear even if you didn't know the story, but once you know the backstory, then... Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's like Peyton Place. <laughs> the breakup of Lindsay Buckingham and Stevie Nicks is the, is the heart center of rumors. This was a relationship that had been together since high school, you have to remember. Stevie's songs on, on rumors are all about claiming yourself. What does it mean to be a strong woman in the shadow of a man who many think is even stronger than you. This was a huge theme of the era. It was a huge thing that women were living through and Stevie captured that in these songs. And it was Stevie's lament for lost love, Dreams, that became the epitaph to her relationship with Lindsay Buckingham, Fleetwood Mac's only number one single and one of their best known songs. Sly Stone had a room at the studio, it's called The Pit. This big round hole in the ground it was all carpeted with a keyboard down at the bottom of it so Stevie would go and just was in heaven she'd take her little dog Ginny and they'd go down in the Sly's room and she would sit in this dark lit some candles and just you know just just do her her magic you know I would take a electric piano with me and um, you know my crocheting and my journals and my books and my art and I just kind of just stay there, you know, until they needed me. So one day, uh, sitting in Sly Stone's bed with this big black curtained bed, fab fabulous, you know, totally. To, to, it wasn't my room, so it could be fabulous. It was somebody else's room. Um, I just went in there one afternoon and wrote Dreams. time she sang it she did such a great job typically we we call that a work vocal and then just a guide track and then we plan on re replacing it later but we tried to replace that lead vocal throughout the rest of the year and there was some parts of the verses we can't we could never beat she could never improve the vocal part so there was some sort of spontaneity that came with her her first um, performance of that The message of dreams has proven resonant with generation after generation of, of young listener, young women particularly, of course. It's, it is the story of, of a breakup and the story of a woman confronting uh, freedom and questioning her lover's desire to be free. But I think because it has that chorus that, that sort of connects to some idea of British folk music, it seems timeless and when you're young and you're you're looking to to think about your own hopes and dreams those words thunder only happens when it's raining you know it just resonates it feels biblical and that's part of its appeal in contrast lindsay buckingham's compositions expressed anger and bitterness buckingham remained the group's driving force and therefore carried additional responsibility for crafting rumors while the other members of the group may have been stung by some of the material coming from their partners he was left with the emotionally unenviable task of having to shape and improve it. Lindsay Buckingham's songs on Rumors are just perfect hard little diamonds of rage. <laughs> I mean, there are no angrier songs in some way. I don't care 
how punk punk was. Lindsey Buckingham was more punk in the vitriol he put in some of those beautiful pop songs on Rumors. Loving you isn't the right thing to do. How can I ever change things that I feel? If I could, maybe I Ask Lindsay to sing his line, and Stevie too. They would never want to do it, and eventually, then Lindsay would would uh, sing his part, and there'd be this huge fight. And, and I never put two and two together. You know, it's like, huh? I just caused that. You know. Up so you won't do. He always had a had a um, you know, his guitar. He was always noodling. And he was either doing that, or he had a tape box that he had full of marijuana and he was always rolling but he was always like he's a very nervous guy you know always rolling joints and then playing guitar and he would always put these these little guitar licks and things so he 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 was very inter instrumental in in stevie's um, um structure of her songs his harmonics his 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 sonic colors obviously became a very big part of uh, rumors you know he he could just he would come in and say i have this great idea i just had had this idea last night and we were always adding parts to it it just became a little bittersweet in terms of wanting to do it. Um, there were times when I had the urge not to want to help her. One day, it, it really got it, uh, to be problematic. We were doing, um, I don't want to, um, never, uh, never Going Back Again, the you know, big picking song. And Stevie was sitting there, and he goes and he starts to, to sing, and he can't hit half the notes. He played the song in the wrong key for him to sing. So anyway, Stevie stormed out of the room when she heard that, and never going back in, and she stormed out of the room. That's where I really saw that, you know, that the lyrics stung her, and, and his refusal to, to sing that during the day made, made um, you know, caused us to waste the whole day. As rumors progressed, the press caught wind of the psychodrama developing in Sausalito. As stories of drugs, breakdowns, and partner swapping swirled, public attention on the band began to mushroom. Rumors is the ultimate tabloid album, and tabloids are starting to take hold in America during this time. People magazine started publishing in 1974. There's a general fascination with both Hollywood stars and television stars. We care even about Olympic stars. You know, what is their love life like? And this is what Fleetwood Mac, this is what Rumors is. In a sense, it's a soap opera in an album. We know that the couples in Fleetwood Mac were breaking up, there was possibly some wife swapping happening, Stevie was this amazing character, this like strange occult figure, there was Mick Fleetwood who was this eccentric British rock star, Lindsay Buckingham, the brooding handsome rejected lover. So the story was just something that grabbed you and then every song played out that story. Every song directly referred to what was going on in the band. It was irresistible. There was a, you know, the album was called Rumors and, and wasn't really an accident. John would be had that idea be, because what was happening is that the, 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 the word got out that the entire band was breaking up and, and on the outside world, we didn't know it. And we, had our, we knew that we were going to put all that aside and get done and we were staying on track. But we'd hear all these stories in the press that, and we'll with Max going to break up. Will will they even be able to stay together to finish the album? You know what's going to happen with their tour? Are they going to support the last the last record by touring? What's going to happen? And and so and 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 we think they're sleeping together. And you know there there's all this carnage and and craziness going on. For Stevie, the money, success, and fame had come very suddenly, and she struggled with the demands of being part of a rock and roll band in the public eye. Her conflicting feelings on the time spent recording rumors appeared on the album's last track, another Nick's confessional suggestively titled Gold Dust Woman. I don't think I've ever been so tired in my whole life as I was when we were like doing that. You know, I think it was shocking me. The whole rock and roll life was really heavy and it was so much work and it was so everyday intense, you know. Being in Fleetwood Mac's like being in the army. It was like you have to be there. 
you have to be there and you have to be there as on time as you can be there and even if there's nothing you have to do you have to be there so Goldust Woman was really my kind of symbolic look at somebody going through a bad relationship and doing a lot of drugs Another autobiographical song, The Gold Dust. Is it fame and celebrity and money? Is there a reference to the, the drugs and the cocaine mania that he's taking over at this point? Um, you know, it, it works on several different levels, uh, but it, it's, 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 it's Stevie's autobiography. In songs, you can always be talking to a third person, but we know from Stevie Nicks' history that she, you know, her songs are a mirror on her heart. That's how she describes them. She's, she's clearly singing to herself. How long can you keep up the cocaine? How many bad relationships are there gonna be? Well, a good few years yet. That's the ironic thing. She, she was writing about it and advising herself uh, as early as 1977. Uh, but it took a, a, a good decade for uh, to actually do anything about it. Rumors wasn't the party album, you know, because I can tell you it, it wasn't because Tusk was and Mirage was, you know, that was insane, and that's when the excesses and the and the indulgence when the, and the going over the top and and thinking you're so great and it was you know was detrimental to the album. But for Rumors, these people were still pretty innocent. They were still. They still, yes, we did some cocaine, but it, but it was in, in some cases just an uh, alternative to coffee. Lindsay and I broke up like on the last day. And we had a big fight. I don't remember what the fight was about, but we were getting ready to go home. And I basically said to him, well, um, I'll pack up the car and you drive it and I'll fly, I'm flying home and you drive. And we were done. After a year of turbulence and tempest, the release of Rumours proved to be as dramatic as its recording. Arriving on the 4th of February 1977, the album surged to number one on both sides of the Atlantic, picked up the Grammy Award for Album of the Year, and topped best record polls across the music press. Rumours is a perfect record. Uh, there really is, there's nothing bad on it. It just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. Uh, I'm not especially fond of Stevie Nicks' sensibility in general. I don't like that witchy, mysterious, sexy blonde stuff. Works great there. Those songs are really good. Stevie Nicks is uh, the wrong kind of sex object, but in this context, it works just great because it's all about sex and jealousy and obsession in, a, in an extremely contained, interesting way. Uh, it's a wonderful record. It's just wonderful. When you've got three singers and three writers in a band. You never get too much of any of them. You get just enough. And I think it's that sort of smorgasbord effect that was also so appealing. But times were changing. The release of Rumours coincided with the rise of the punk movement and a new generation of bands that were openly critical of what they viewed to be the stale, radio-friendly and self-indulgent rock and roll typified by Fleetwood Mac. Though rumours may have dominated the charts, the band had moved a world away from rock's grassroots, where punk had become all-conquering. Seventy-seven is the year of Rocket to Russia, never mind the bollocks, Marquee Moon. It's the great flowering of punk, CBGB, and English punk both. And for many of my friends, that was what was happening. It's very easy to look at rumours and say, OK, 1977, this is swimming against the tide. You know, this easy listening, radio friendly, glossy sound. Uh, this is the year of, this is the, uh, the annus mirabilis of, of, of punk. But it, I think it's a trap. In, in fact, I think rumours does so well 
because of the context of the time. Those who weren't enamoured of punk and you know wanted something that was a little more melodic, a little more uh, friendly on the ear, uh, but at the same time had an artistic credibility and didn't have the pretension and the pomposity of the prog rock groups uh, and didn't have the kind of vacuous banality of disco and the Bee Gees, which is the other big thing that's happening at, at, at this time. Um, Fleetwood Mac step into that role perfectly. So my argument would be that uh, far from swimming against the tide of punk, punk itself creates the climate in which an album like Rumours is, is going to take off. But Lindsay Buckingham's head was turned. Whether or not Fleetwood Mac simply occupied a different musical space, Lindsay took an active interest in the punk acts and became keen to embrace some of their ideas. When, in 1978, the band convened in Los Angeles to record Tusk, the follow-up album to Rumours, a perplexed Fleetwood Mac discovered that Buckingham was set on a radical change of course. We walked in the studio to, to do Rumours number two, and Lindsay walked in the studio to do Punk number one. You know, and, and he didn't tell us that. He didn't say, guys, I want to make a change. You know, the first day in the studio, in this room right here on this console, he said, uh, like usual, he would, he would be getting a guitar sound and I'd be talking to him saying, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Why don't you try, maybe try a Strat instead of your Les Paul or maybe that other amp instead of this amp, but I'm going to use different effects and maybe brighten it up or use thicker strings or something. While we're, and he said, okay, you got it. And, and finally, I'm going, this is perfect. Sounds really good. He goes, great. Now turn all your knobs 180 degrees. I said, what? He said, turn all your knobs 180 degrees. So, all right. So I turn everything and, and it just goes <laughs> and it's distorting and it sounds horrible. He goes, now record it. I was quite excited about trying some new approaches. With a certain amount of trepidation, I did get the band into the idea of trying some new processes and, and uh, some, some different sensibilities. Lindsay basically said, if you don't do it, I'm going to quit. I'm out of here. And so there was this blackmail issue going on there, which was un unpleasant. Uh, you know, I, I, I kind of said, let him go, you know? Where's he gonna go, you know? You need to break this in you know, a cycle, you know, uh, now. L Lindsay is one of those people that will go up on the cross to make a point and die. Lindsay knew what the hell he was doing and he knew why he wanted to do it and he saw that point that he wanted to get to and he would know as he still does today he knows when he hasn't got there and he he gets sort of relatively crucified sometimes in terms including himself on that journey things we did Tusca Dodger Stadium with the USC marching band that was that was one a brilliant day seeing all all of 150 people out there on the on the Dodger of, of baseball field playing all these horns and and us having to technically do it it was it was great but uh, you can't be a punk record and, and have just your songs punk because then it sounds weird you know he didn't want to be categorized with the dinosaurs and the boring old farts and the has-beens. So the uh, punk provides an impetus here to people who are not by any stretch of the imagination part of the punk movement or making music in a punk style but it does push them to expand the envelope and, 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 and to be more experimental and progressive and, and I think that is a strong pull on Lindsay, less so on uh, the rest of the band. Mm -hmm. 
sing the melody for a second, because I just want to see if it sounds any good at all to, uh, okay. if we left your melody on there and I just sang like the lower part or something. Okay. I don't think it will. So just... You feel good, said it's funny that, that you understood. No, you guys, it's funny, funny that, that you understood. <laughs> his marshalling of the band, his, his expert marshalling of, of Fleetwood Mac in the previous two albums has sort of toppled into megalomania. And I don't think he's entertaining an awful lot of uh, suggestions from other members of the band. It took 13 months in one place, so we weren't moving around. So it was a long, long 13 months. We were recording at Village Recorders in Santa Monica, and we were recording six days a week, and we were all there every day. And, you know, we just got through it, and it was really horrible. The recording of Tusk couldn't have been further from the punk rock ethic, as Lindsay's hubris created the most expensive record ever produced. A double album conceived by millionaire rock stars flaunting the trappings of fame. By the late 70s, the music business had become a lavish land of excess, and in a territory characterized by private jets, stadium shows, entourages, and expensive drugs, there were few bands as indulgent as Fleetwood Mac. A key part of what happened to rock and roll in the 70s is the music industry itself had become incredibly corporate, the numbers were just massive, People were selling so many records, tours were getting bigger and bigger. Rock stars were royalty suddenly. Fleetwood Mac's flying around in a Learjet, right? This is not where rock and roll started, but it definitely turns rock and roll into a dark and dangerous version of the American dream. Nowhere does rock and roll become more excessive than in Los Angeles. We got into the, the studio to do Tusk and uh, um, we stocked it, you know, very well with the finest champagne, um, the finest cocaine, finest marijuana. Uh, we would typically, uh, and I would notice that we'd, we'd be ordering in from the finest restaurants, lobster dinners every night and uh, um, caviar. And so, you know, I was thinking, okay, this is kind of pretty cool. We're, you know, we're on a, you know, class A restaurant here. Uh, we're in the studio making the record. But um, in hindsight, what was happening was, was everybody had, had changed. And everybody wasn't that sweet, innocent person, you know, and there, everybody had their own stash of cocaine or their own stash of stuff. And there was, they would, and they all had their own team of people that supported them. And yeah, well, Lindsay wants this, Stevie wants this. You know, there's this bloated, excessive, moneyed lifestyle. And it then starts to impact upon the music as well. Once the excess and the money takes over and group members have got their own individual management and they're living in their, their separate little worlds and they don't really come together and the whole dynamic, the whole purpose of being in, 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 in a group really is, is pulled away from under them. Stevie had changed, uh, she might have changed the most, you know, she, she, everybody told her that she was the, the goddess, she was, she was amazing, she, and she had a full entourage of people that said, Stevie, you're wonderful, and, and let me open the door for you, let me do everything, so she got very, you know, I have to, I have to have this kind of cavassier, and I have to have this, and, and um, my, my people, her, the room would be, in the back there would be filled with her, her her supporters, you know, who, you know, Stevie wants this, and, 
and you have to go through them and even to talk to Stevie half the time. It was it was it was almost out of control at that point. And I think Tusk I think Tusk was out of control. And although the band members may have been living in their separate gilded cantons, old tensions resurfaced to further strain the Tusk sessions. Stevie, whose relationship with Buckingham remained frosty, had for some time been conducting an affair with Mick Fleetwood. It was an affair that came to an abrupt end with the revelation that Fleetwood was involved with her close friend, Sarah Rekor, and formed the basis of one of Nick's best known songs, Sarah. Lindsay, who has never really gotten over this relationship with me, and now Mick has done this thing, and he's living with my friend Sarah, and she's banished from the studio. And so I lost Mick and my friend Sarah in one fell swoop. Stevie Nicks' songs on Tusk mostly are not that well remembered, but of course they're Sarah. And Sarah is a hugely important song in Stevie Nicks' repertoire for a few reasons. It does something that, in fact, a lot of Stevie Nicks songs do, which is it plays with gender and sexuality. People wondered when the song came out, is Stevie Nicks a lesbian? Is this about her lover? She claims it's not, it's about a friend. But she definitely had the guts and the smarts to play around with, with that idea. And I think that is a very daring act that also was very um, canny. Stevie Nicks has always acted like both a man and a woman in her music. She has never shied away from uh, embodying characters that are typically male, you know, seeking freedom and, and being strong and forthright and all of those qualities that, that are conventionally associated with masculinity. At the same time, she's all about softness and ornamentation and, and all of that feminine stuff. So in a song like Sarah, She's playing an ardent male, but with a feminine feeling. And I think that is the brilliance of that song, and it was a fascinating mystery to a lot of people and remains one of uh, her fans' favorite songs. There's the fame and the celebrity, and there's also this desire for another more conventional life that, in a way, she's given up for the fame and celebrity. There's this inability post Lindsay, it seems, to sustain personal relationships. You know, she has an affair with Mick Fleetwood, uh, there's Don Henley, uh, and, and all of these are. Uh, fleeting and all of that is is in this song uh, it's uh, the quintessential stevie nicks song and, and and the themes that i think drive her art are all epitomized in that one song I'm not convinced that Stevie Nicks' songs get quite the careful attention, production attention, that they got in the previous two albums. I think um, I think there's a certain uh, there's a certain cavalier approach here and there, as there is actually throughout the album. Uh, that's where Buckingham was at at the time, but um, I think they could have perhaps been uh, cradled with a little more sensitivity here and there. We listen to their voices, we know our own voice. Despite a number of songs contributed by Stevie and Christine McVie, Tusk remained Lindsay Buckingham's vision, and it was he who took the blame for the album's disappointing reception. Following its release in late 79, the album peaked at number four in the US and made the top spot in Britain, but sales fell far short of rumors and manifestly failed to justify the studio bill. Tusk also disappointed as an artistic statement, 
with mixed reviews from the music press, and Lindsay became resentful, feeling that he was being unfairly maligned by both his bandmates and the record label. The best things about Tusk are probably Stevie's songs. I think history has, has revised our opinions of it a little bit, and we've come to appreciate more some of Lindsay's more left-field touches on, on the record. Uh, but, you know, it's Stevie's songs like, like Sarah that, that have endured from that record. Fleetwood Mac supported Tusk with an extensive tour, moving through the US, Europe, Japan, Australia, and into the 1980s. During the tour, the relationship between Stevie Nicks and Lindsay Buckingham reached its nadir, with Lindsay publicly mocking Stevie while on stage in New Zealand. When the final appearances wrapped up, the band agreed to go on hiatus in order to pursue personal projects outside of the Fleetwood Mac frame. Capitalizing on her soaring profile and ardent fan base, Stevie turned her thoughts towards striking out on her own. And, in tandem with record executive Paul Fishkin and his associate Danny Goldberg, she founded Modern Records as the first step in launching as a solo artist. Though a prolific writer and prominent member of one of the world's most successful bands, questions remained as to whether Stevie could carry an entire album, and the business of remaking her as a solo performer was fraught with risk. You know, the idea that she could break out of Fleetwood Mac and be her own solo artist was something that not everyone in the music industry believed. <laughs> in retrospect, that seems ridiculous, but it's true at the time. Rock music is always classified as men's music. I think there was a question, would women want to consume an album from Stevie Nicks? Would men want to buy an album from Stevie Nicks? How does Stevie Nicks define herself as a solo artist? I think the challenge for her is finding how her strong flavor can dominate a whole record without overwhelming an audience. And Stevie moved quickly to give herself the strongest hand possible. Leveraging her status in the industry, she embarked on the recording of her debut album, Bella Donna, supported by a star-studded lineup of rock and roll heavyweights, including Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, Bruce Springsteen producer Jimmy Iovine, and her former boyfriend and Eagles vocalist, Don Henley. With Belladonna, Stevie Nicks enlisted her, her posse of L.A. top-notch talent. So you have members of Tom Petty's band, she's duetting with Don Henley, you have great studio musicians like Waddy Wachtel on the record, and it really is that top-shelf L.A. record. It works for Stevie because it allows her to make a sound that is both very individualistic and, and suits her unique voice, but also fits in perfectly with adult contemporary music. It's of a piece with a lot of records being made at this time that you hear on adult contemporary radio. She looked at the mainstream and said, I want to be in the mainstream. I don't even want to be, I don't want to be a special artist in the way Fleetwood Mac was in that world. I want to I, I wanna go all the way and become a pop star. She's very aware that her, her fans respond to that, 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 sort, of, uh, that sort of flighty, uh, poetic, free spirit image that she's, uh, that she's developed in her time at Fleetwood Mac. And that's all, that's all further exploited with the, the very name of the album, the album cover, and you know, the songs within the album.
all the Stevie Nicks solo albums, I think Belladonna is probably the best realised. The cult of Stevie Nicks had obviously built up in an audience, but it also built up around her fellow professionals. There was a lot of musicians who wanted to come and make music with Stevie Nicks. Uh, and the album is, is pretty good of its sort, but one can't help but think Jimmy Iovine is, is a good producer, but it's, 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 a little bit, um, it's a little bit on the generic side. It's a little bit off the peg L.A. rock. And I have to say, that's really what happens with most of Stevie Nicks' uh, solo work, which is a bit of a shame, because the promise of her best work, it seems to me, was never really fulfilled in her solo recordings. I took Lindsay in a copy of the record right when it was fresh off the press. And I signed it and said a lot of really wonderful things to him. And um, I, I set it up on the console. And he moved it and put it down on the floor, just kind of leaning against one of the steps in the studio room. And I watched him all day long. I watched him from like 3 in the afternoon until 3 or 4 in the, the next morning and he walked right out of that room without the record. And I never forgave him for that. Any fears around how the solo Stevie would go over dissolved with the release of Belladonna. Issued on the 27th of July, 1981, the album soared to the top of the Billboard chart, was certified platinum less than three months after its release, and spawned four top 40 singles, two of which hit the top 10. Stevie, however, had little time to enjoy the success. By the time Belladonna hit the stores, she had already been pulled back onto the Fleetwood Mac juggernaut and the recording of a new album, Mirage. Mirage was, was an interesting record. We attempted to recreate rumors, so we decided to go somewhere else to, to record it. And uh, I uh, had heard about this uh, studio in France called the, uh, called the Chateau and uh, where you can actually go there and live and, and record on, outside of Paris. I went and checked it out, it looked fine, so um, at the request of Mick, I went ahead and booked the studio. And turns out, what I didn't realize is that uh, we had to basically take, bring Stevie and Lindsay along, kicking and dragging into their feet. They didn't, they didn't want to go, they didn't want to be sequestered, they had their own, you know, they wanted the best, they wanted they, it was just, they, they didn't handle the transition. They couldn't get cocaine as easily. Stevie was convinced that old chateau was haunted. We still had an entourage of people. Interesting thing, on this album, Stevie was the one saying, if you don't do it my way, I'm out of here. With Mirage, you enter into the long afterlife of Fleetwood Mac, in a way. Uh, everyone's off on their solo projects, definitely developing their own fan bases, and of course the personal relationships have seriously unraveled in the band. So uh, this is what Fleetwood Mac continues to be over the next several decades as they reunite, tour, make some new music, and break up again. And the dream is gone, you know, the dream of what Fleetwood Mac was, that, that tabloid fantasy has totally dissolved. Although Tusk had not necessarily been critically well received and it certainly hadn't done as well commercially as, as rumours, I think there was a, an appreciation that the group had moved forward with Tusk. They had tried something slightly different, uh, whether you thought it was successful or not. And then Mirage feels like uh, a step backwards. The recording of Mirage proved to be a struggle 
as the band members balanced the competing demands of their respective solo careers and came to resent the commitments imposed by Fleetwood Mac. It was a difficult time for Stevie in particular. On the day that Belladonna reached number one, she received the devastating news that her closest friend, Robin Snyder, had been diagnosed with leukemia. A relationship with producer Jimmy Iovine had hit the rocks, and she had been forced to cut short her first solo tour in order to rejoin the Mirage sessions. Despite the pressures, Stevie managed to contribute four songs to the album, including a single in Gypsy, a song that she dedicated to Robin Snyder. Stevie was, she had an alternative to, to go to, and, and, when, and she was, whenever she was doing her own thing, she was the queen bee. She was the boss, so, so here, she still had to deal with, she still had to deal with Lindsay uh, and, the, and the, those, the old feelings, just like Christine still, John never got over it. John, whenever he had a drink, he'd start buzzing around Christine and, and driving her crazy. And, and Lindsay would be doing the same thing. Lindsay would, there would be a lot of friction between Stevie and Lindsay. And, and so she kind of said, I don't need this anymore. Um, she still hung in there, but we, we cut um, Mirage short. It was just hard for us to keep the ball rolling and try to, I wanted, I was, I was continually hoping we could do another, another Rumors. In Mirage, I realized that it wasn't going to happen. I think cocaine was well embedded in, in, in the process and um, it just made it very difficult to actually make the record. What saves it is, is Stevie's songs, um, preeminent amongst them, Gypsy, which Again, like, like all of Stevie's greatest songs, you know, there is so much of her life in that, in that song. You know, she is looking back to her life pre-Fleetwood Mac, which from this vantage point now seems simpler and less troubled and, and, and terribly attractive. Um, and yet it's the success of Fleetwood Mac that has given her the platform and has... Uh, allowed her to fulfil her ambitions and uh, to, to, to take her artistic vision forward. I think Gypsy was, was her dreams again. She dedicated it to, to, to Robin, and, and Robin was her, her dearest friend who died of cancer soon thereafter, and, uh, and um, it was, that was hard on her. She was, I know she was, between, she was dating a lot of different guys, and so that was a distraction. She was dating Jimmy Iovine, and I remember he came over a few times and, and, and had some input to, the, to her music, and so she was, she was struggling. There is this trooper spirit about Stevie, I think, that um, accepts fate, whether it's her fate, whether it's uh, her, her friend Robin, who, who she's you know, more or less watched die from leukemia. Um, so, so the song on one level is looking back, but at the same time it's looking forward and, uh, and, 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 and saying, bloodied but unbowed, we, we march on. But as the 80s marched on, the difficulties in Nick's personal life mounted. Following the death of Robin Snyder, Stevie had married Kim Anderson, Robin's bereaved husband. It was a union made in the aftermath of loss, and it didn't last, the divorce coming within just three months. During the short course of the marriage, Stevie worked on a second solo record, The Wild Heart, a process that she later described as therapeutic. 
The album was once again produced by Jimmy Iovine and supported by Tom Petty and the big names that had graced Belladonna, with the addition, this time, of Mick Fleetwood. Going back and listening to Stevie Nicks' work from the 80s, two themes actually surface. One is this mythological character she's constructing of, you know, like the cape she's wearing on the cover of The Wild Heart. She's mists of Avalon, you know, uh, a mystical being. But the other story is not mystical at all, and it's the story of 1980s corporate rock. A lot of her songs are about touring, about living a certain lifestyle, trying to survive in a game that had grown quite burdensome to her. And she, like the Eagles, like Tom Petty, is making songs about what it means to be a road dog and what it means to be a studio rocker. And we can't always hear that because we're distracted by the aura of uh, feminine magic that Stevie weaves around these things. But that's her story too. No one looked, I walked by. Just an invitation would have been just fine. Said no to him again and again. First he took my heart, then he ran. No one knows how I feel. What I say unless you read between my lines. One man walked away from me. First he took my hand. Stand back, stand back, stand back. In the middle of my room, I do not hear from you. When you look at the lyrics of Stevie Nicks' songs and take Stand Back, a song that's on the Wild Heart. I mean, these are songs about trying to erect boundaries when boundaries are not really coming very naturally. And that's a huge theme in her music. I mean, yes, she's a role model for female independence, but she's also taking incredible risks in her personal life. She told me that she has sacrificed her personal contentment for her career. And, you know, I think she felt that quite strongly and it comes out in some of the songs, you know, there is this dichotomy between the life that she might have had and the life that she has had. I then asked her what she would change and the answer was very little, if anything. So there is this paradox there that uh, has, has certainly driven a lot of her best songwriting. Um, so she has this image of being very strong and very independent, uh, which I think is, is, is justified in, in many ways. You know, she's been through the, the ringer and she's still kind of out there doing it. Um, but there is this damage. And following the release of The Wild Heart, the damage was becoming serious. The album had been generally well received and Stevie had supported it with a large scale US tour. On the surface, her career was soaring, but behind the scenes, it was clear that her cocaine addiction had become severe and that her work was suffering. Sessions for a new record, provisionally entitled Mirror Mirror, had broken down, with Nick's repeatedly scrapping material and producer Jimmy Iovine eventually walking out. Though a new Stevie Nicks album had been slated for 1984, it was clear that there was little prospect of achieving it. Eventually, Stevie turned to her old friend and producer from the early days, Keith Olsen, to help rescue the project, now renamed Rock A Little. Well, um, <laughs> uh, what can I tell you about Rock A Little? I wish I could tell you more about Rock A Little than there's time to tell you. Um, it started about over a year ago, and for many reasons, all different kind of strange reasons wound up into one. Uh, it wasn't right. It was right, but there was something, you know, like you had the wrong pair of shoes or something. It was wrong. And so, and I knew it wasn't right, and I didn't know why. So I just sort of kind of wandered through this year and a half of trying to understand why I didn't feel that it was right. And I finally kind of understand now why it wasn't, which isn't something I can really tell you now, but it is right now. Uh, she asked me to come and work with her. It was at a dark time of, of uh, us. I was, uh, I was working with her boyfriend at the time, Joe Walsh, and uh, she asked me to do a record. And so uh, 
I started working on it, but I couldn't finish it. Stevie will be Stevie. Stevie is all about Stevie. Thank God she's, you know, there was a time at, during Rock a Little that she wasn't singing in tune very much. It was obvious. You know, that's that, you know, that cycle. What you hear, what you sing, what you think you hear is a little different. And it affects pitch, it affects quality. I had to boot her out of the studio, say, you don't deserve to be in the studio. When I, when I turned my back on that thing, I kind of had to go like that. I don't think I've ever listened to the whole thing. Because it, it, was, it was, you know, Stevie is a very good friend, a wonderful person that I, you know, there's times in your life where you have everything before something, and that's that defining part of your life. Well, doing the Fleetwood Mac album with Stevie and Lindsay was that defining thing in my life that defined everything on from on, there on. And to be angry with Stevie was really, you know, that was, that was, uh, I didn't like that feeling. I didn't want to have that feeling. She was telling tales about her glamorous, fucked up life in a musically slightly over the top. As a solo artist, you know, she, Lindsay's gone. And she basically, she is an arena rock artist. The big drums. So it could be Toto or Journey. You listen to it, I mean, it's not a band, but it's the same thing. It's the same idea. Something that's going to fill a sports arena. Uh, and she parades her suffering around. Um, and I think that is the source of her appeal. You can talk to me. Talk to me. You can talk to me. You can set your secrets free, baby. What's on there, I, I don't think she'd be very happy with. You know, it's, it's not a real good record. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't have that uh, Edge of 17 kind of thing on it. It doesn't have that great duet on it. It doesn't have any of that stuff because she was, uh, she was past all that. And I did write a song during that time with her that she ends most of her solo concerts with. Anyone ever written anything for you? In all your darkest hours, did you ever hear me sing? She had this thing, and, and I put some chords to it and then put a bridge to it. She said she never liked the bridge. And I said, oh, okay, well, at least it made it go from something other than just that A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B section. And she said, yeah. I think she wrote that song for uh, Joe Walsh. He was quite a character in her life there during that time. Has anyone ever given anything to you? I had to make really a lot of changes and stops and understand what was going on in my life that was other people influencing me and talking to me and making me feel certain ways that that maybe I let my own self go a little bit and not you know really re rely on my own intuitions which are always the best ones for me. She was being uh, controlled by other outside influences. Some of them demons, some of them people, some of them uh, you know other stuff that she was trying to be somebody she was not and when she just sits and writes from her heart and her soul she'll always be Stevie Dix and we'll all love her
because of that. Despite the difficult birth of Rock A Little and mixed reviews on its release in 1985, the album was a strong seller, buoyed by two hit singles in Talk To Me and I Can't Wait. To keep the momentum going, Stevie embarked on a marathon six-month tour, but the problems that had so blighted her work in the studio accompanied her onto the stage. Her appearances were often rambling and erratic, and audiences noted the toll that cocaine and alcohol had taken on her voice. When the tour concluded, Stevie finally checked into rehab. But while she grappled with her addictions, the spectre of Fleetwood Mac had reappeared. After several years apart, the band, minus Stevie, had recorded together for a film soundtrack and discussions over a new Fleetwood Mac album had taken place. Initial sessions commenced towards the end of 1985, but it would be 18 months before a record, Tango in the Night, finally surfaced. It proved to be an enormous hit. Tango in the Night became the second biggest seller in the band's history, outdone only by rumors, and restored Fleetwood Mac to the forefront of contemporary pop. Its production, however, had been driven largely by the work of Christine McVie and a reinvigorated Lindsay Buckingham, both of whom contributed top five singles with Big Love and Little Lies, respectively. Stevie joined the project at the 11th hour, and although her song Seven Wonders scraped into the top 20, she was barely present on the album. Well, you know, I'm pretty busy. I mean, not, that's not even, that's not being anything except honestly, honest, honest, honest. Um, they, you know, Fleetwood Mac has my songs, if they want them. They always have had them. Um, if they want me, I'll probably be there, you know. If they make the effort to want me to be there, I'll probably be there. Looking out for love In the night so still Oh, how I feel Your kingdom In that house The strange thing about Tango in the Night is how cohesive a record it is, given the circumstances in, in which it is made. Steve's contribution is severely limited, where previous Fleetwood Mac albums, I would argue that her songwriting has been the strongest aspect of those records. She's out on a solo tour. Um, she's, uh, you know, dealing with addiction problems. She's more or less mailing her songs and ideas in. She spends very little time in, in the studio. And yet, you know, the record that emerges is the second biggest seller after rumors, and unjustifiably so to an extent, in, in that uh, there is this surprising cohesion. Um, I mean, Lindsay comes back to the party, I think, very strongly. And uh, you know, he, his willpower gets that record over the line. Buckingham's pop sensibilities are to the fore in this in this record, and it's it's all to the good. It means that 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 every every inch of the album is is 
is full of hooks and ear candy and bits of things to keep you interested. The songs are really strong, the, 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 the choruses are, are, are very memorable. Uh, his material and Christine McVie's material particularly benefits enormously from uh, this glossy, mechanized, uh, minced through a fair light production. Uh, it all just becomes this, this wonderful wash of, of modern pop music. The band had planned to follow Tango in the Night with their first tour in five years, though it had proved difficult to get Buckingham to commit. An agreement was eventually reached and a ten-week schedule booked, but with opening night confirmed, Lindsay abruptly changed his mind. It was an announcement that finally broke the band. Following a violent argument with Stevie at a group meeting, Lindsay walked out of Fleetwood Mac. The other members, however, resolved that the show must go on and drafted two new players, Billy Burnett and Rick Vito, onto the tour. It was certainly a negative thing to do as far as the band was concerned and they were very hurt by it, but I just felt I needed to somehow reclaim my sanity. Because of that guilt I have always had about not leaving Fleetwood Mac, I flew off of the couch and across the room to seriously attack him. And I did. I mean, and, and I'm, not, I'm not real scary, but I can be fairly ferocious. And I grabbed him, you know, which almost got me killed. It got ugly. Physically ugly. I screamed horrible obscenities at him, and uh, I thought he was going to kill me. And I think he probably thought he was going to kill me, too. And um, I said to him, you know, if the, rest of the, if, the, the ba if the rest of the people in the band don't get you, my family will. My dad and my brother will kill you. Tango in the Night was a hugely successful album commercially, but it also signaled the end of the classic Fleetwood Mac lineup as Lindsey Buckingham finally left the band, which I think for Stevie Nicks must have felt like her comfort zone was dissolving. In a way... I mean, that comfort zone had been gone for a long time, but there was always the frame of Fleetwood Mac for her to enter back into as she made her solo ventures. And here, her life partner, essentially her artistic life partner, was off, out, and she really had to think about what it meant now to really be on her own. It was a very abrupt um, departure, let's say. And um, I think they, were, they had the whole tour planned out, a little bit of panic going on, maybe, but the record was very strong, and um, I guess it was, you know, that's uh, one of Mick's strong points, or he's always had a keen intuition for finding people and, and putting people together. The first thing I asked Mick was, uh, because he asked if I wanted to sing anything or try out any material of mine, I said, I'd like to try a couple of the Peter Green songs. So. Um, I think it was uh, my versatility at that point in time and my knowledge of the early stuff that sort of uh, added uh, that dimension to the band that um, perhaps hadn't been there in a while. And so um, Billy took over um, some of the, the Lindsay songs and I didn't sort of mess with that. I did a couple of Peter Green songs and that sort of rounded the, the show out. In the absence of Lindsay, greater responsibility fell on Stevie as the central focus on stage, and the band remodeled itself around her, incorporating songs from her solo albums, as well as her backing singers Sharon Solani and Laurie Perry into the live show. Her own work didn't sound that much different from what she was doing with Fleetwood Mac and uh, some of the songs, Stand Back, things like that just were a natural and uplift for the set. Stevie's presence was, was so very strong and um, so the, it, was, it was natural. After the tour concluded, Stevie Nicks began work on another solo album, The Other Side of the Mirror. Released in 1989, it hit the top 10 in the US and reached number three in the UK. The reviews had generally been unfavorable. The record was boosted by association with the phenomenal success of Tango in the Night. 
It's very hard to separate out uh, you know, the success of Stevie, the solo performer, from her success as a member of Fleetwood Mac. Obviously, one uh, derives from the other. Uh, but, you know, I mean, don't forget, with Belladonna, she's had three top 20 singles, so she ought to, by this stage, be established as an artist who can hold their own without being buttressed by Fleetwood Mac. You know, the problem is that uh, each of her solo records is, is, is probably not as good as the one that's gone before, so you're, you're, you're facing the, the law of diminishing returns. developing that sound that's very classic kind of 80s MOR features Bruce Hornsby who's like the favorite musician of all LA artists Kenny G's playing his sax the ultimate light sax player um, it is that sound of the 80s of, of, of corporate pop and I think it achieves everything that can be achieved within that sound is that a sound we should all be loving today? <laughs> I think there's a question. <laughs> Following The Other Side of the Mirror, Stevie turned her attention to the first Fleetwood Mac album of the post-Buckingham era, Behind the Mask. The band had introduced both Burnett and Vito to their studio process by putting out a greatest hits package, for which they had recorded a couple of new songs. But having contributed little to Tango in the Night, Stevie now carried much of the responsibility for writing, and there was no Buckingham to help realize her ideas. Stevie wrote all the time. She's very much a person, say, if you were on tour, she'd be up into the late hours of the night, always writing her things, and not necessarily songs, just poems or, or dreams or ideas or whatever. So she had a lot of lyrics, and I knew this, and I had a lot of um, tracks and musical ideas. So it was never a, a situation where we'd sit down and say, okay, let's start a song from scratch. It was more a case of, of me playing her some tracks, you know, and saying, like, like this one, or, or maybe I had, I think for Love is Dangerous, I had the first verse and a, and a rough demo. And she said, oh, I like that. I could add something to that. So I would give that to her. She'd come back with second verse and a bridge, say. another song called The Second Time and I had uh, again a, a, a melody and a little demo of no words at all and but I had a dream where that song came from and I explained my dream to her and so she was listening listening and then she came back maybe a week later with um, a lot of what I explained in my dream but interpreted her way and a whole different melody that fit over the melody I had originally come up with. So that was interesting, I thought. Doing the recordings for the greatest hits led us to realize that this was a band that uh, 
work well together both live and in the studio so there wasn't any nervousness going into the studio it was just they were going to take as long as it took to put together a new record and um, Stevie had strong ideas of how she liked her tunes to sound Chris obviously had strong ideas and uh, um, everybody was open it was very uh, casual and uh, creative process that just took the better part of a year you could Listen back to that record. I thought, production-wise, I thought it was uh, it, it held its own. It stood, sort of stood its own ground. It, the only thing to me that was different about it was it didn't have Lindsay's presence there. But I think that the sound of Stevie's and Chris's voices was still very much there. I remember listening to it back to back to Tango in the Night at the time and, and thinking, well, I think this holds up pretty well. You know, it was. Um, we felt proud of it at the time. I don't think there is a Fleetwood Mac without Lindsey Buckingham. I mean, I just don't think it's the same band. Uh, he's he's a, not only a key songwriter, a key singer, the key guitarist, but just his whole essence and sensibility, the, the, the heat he provides to the cool of Stevie Nicks and Christine McVie is absolutely essential. To me, it's not Fleetwood Mac anymore. Though Fleetwood Mac toured behind the mask, the band was beginning to run out of steam. Both Christine and Stevie initially announced that they would no longer be available for live performances. But in 1991, Stevie went a step further and confirmed that she was leaving the group for good. I think maybe in the short term, she might have felt like, well, look, if this is not really working for whatever reason right now, I do have my solo career that I can go out and do. But I don't think ever for a moment did she ever feel like um, she was going to give up Fleetwood Mac forever. I, I, I think Fleetwood Mac is very dear to her and, and was then. It, it really wasn't so much, I think, that she left as it was that the whole thing sort of fell apart for various reasons. But I, I, I think that Stevie truly loves Fleetwood Mac, always has, and probably always will. And I, I don't think, even though she has her solo career, which she loves also, it gives her a chance to really do all of her material. Um, Fleetwood Mac is, is very, very special to her, I believe. And it wasn't long before the classic Fleetwood Mac lineup were back together. In 1993, they reunited to play Bill Clinton's presidential inauguration gala though the performance remained a one-off. Stevie had been inactive since Behind the Mask, suffering from a crippling addiction to the tranquilizer clonopin. She eventually emerged from rehab in 1994 with her first album of original material in five years, Street Angel, and a tour featuring former Fleetwood Mac guitarist Rick Vito followed. Though Street Angel was met by dismissive reviews and poor sales, it marked the beginning of Nick's transition from superstar frontwoman of the world's biggest band to a mature individual artist supported by a dedicated fan base. We didn't play the huge places as often. We played more contained uh, venues. Obviously, Stevie's fans were just as supportive, and you know, Stevie Nick's fans are pretty in love, let's say. And so there was always that there. We traveled in buses more, and so it was like the rolling Stevie Nicks uh, continuous um, private party. It, Stevie's very much a person that likes to have her, 
her people, her, you know, her, her entourage, her, her close girlfriends, her close musician friends, you know. And it doesn't just, it's not just, okay, we finished this, the show, see you guys. It's, you're either going on the bus all night and having, you know, watching movies and talking, or it's back at the hotel, messing around with the piano. It's, it's very much that kind of um, lighthearted camaraderie that uh, Stevie's very fond of, and it's fun, you know. It's, she's, she's very fun that way. I think Street Angel is a, a, a fairly weak album. She's addicted to painkillers by this stage, which is a you know, tragic story all in it, it, itself, that uh, you get prescribed these drugs to overcome your addiction to cocaine, and the addiction to the cure actually is worse than, than the addiction to the thing that is being cured. Uh, you know, I mean, she gave me a quite horrific description of her life at this particular point. Uh, you know, and she says that uh, if anybody prescribes you with these particular tranquilizers, uh, you know, you're better off going and hanging yourself. Um, she's suffering from writer's block because. I think, of, of the addiction to the painkillers. She can still put an album together because I think a lot of the songs on that record are probably based on fragments from her journals going back over I don't know how many years. So, you know, I think whenever she was struggling for songs, she could go back to these, these notebooks and uh, find things that hadn't found their way onto an album at that particular time that could be rescued and, 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 and reworked. Um, you know, but she's, she's not in a, a, a good way. But this is the start of, you know, the, the, the modern, mature Stevie Nicks, if you like. And essentially, I suppose it's about being a survivor, as much as anything. Uh, you know, she's, she's been through the mangle. I always thought she was very strong. She got on stage, if she was not feeling well, you didn't know it because the higher power would come out, the, the, the bigger person, which is, I think, what happens to all great musicians. You would let that connection to your higher self come out, or it just does. And um, that's all I've ever seen of Stevie. You know, she's got a very distinct and energy, you know, that's very distinctive. It's her. It's, uh, it's nobody else like her. She doesn't try to be like anybody else. And it's very strong, comes through, and it came through in Fleetwood Mac, came through in Street Angel Tour. And Stevie did indeed go on to become one of Rock's great survivors. The Fleetwood Mac story continued through several reunions, beginning with a tour in 1997 and including a new studio album with 2003's Say You Will. In the early millennium, Stevie relaunched her solo career with Trouble in Shangri-La, a critically praised album that restored her to the top five on the Billboard chart, and 2011's In Your Dreams performed just as strongly. More than 30 years after the release of Belladonna, Stevie Nicks has gone on to become rock and roll's first lady, frequently cited as a key influence by a new generation of female singer-songwriters. Stevie attracts a lot of people. Uh, there's, a, there's a huge mystique going, uh, about her. They, everyone's fascinated with Stevie, which I believe was all due to those early days of her screaming Rhiannon on stage and twirling around in her, in her black outfit, you know, and the veils and, 
and the witch thing, and she's adored by millions. Everybody loves Stevie. Everybody wants to come see Stevie. So until it's still to this day. You know, she put out a new solo record in 2011. Uh, she's going back on the road with Fleetwood Mac in 2013. There's nothing cynical about Stevie still doing it 40 years later because it's what she does and if she wasn't doing it, what would her life be?